But it started off with, you know, I would get maybe online messages from anonymous accounts, then maybe more of them. And there's obviously the different variations of use that you get. And as journalists, I'm sure you actually know an awful lot about it as well. But there's the kind of the public commentary that you get that everybody can see. And then there's private messages, there's voice notes, there's letters, and then there's in person. Mm. And I think that was the scale that it went with for me over time as well. And I was perhaps a little bit obnoxious about it in the beginning. And I always thought people would say, God, I saw that abuse about you online. How mm-hmm. did you feel? And I'd be going, oh, it's like water over duck's back. Thought I was so, I don't know what, above it. That sounds ridiculous, but that's genuinely how I felt. And it did get worse and worse and worse over time. And maybe I didn't realise how much it was building up. Mm. And it wasn't until um, I'd experienced it in person in terms of on the street and different things like that. But it wasn't until somebody... Um, who had started off with messages to my work phone, then ended up turning up at the house on several occasions, wouldn't stop doing that, that it it changed everything for me. I felt then like every message I got was potentially somebody who could turn up to my house. And then I, it really changed how I behaved in every single thing I did then. Like you were frightened. Absolutely terrified. Like I'm from West Cork. I didn't have a lock for a door, even if I wanted to, if you know, we didn't have mm-hmm. a key for the door. Um, I didn't have blinds. I didn't have any kind of security. And now I have CCTV, I have blinds, I have locks. I'm hyper aware. Um, so yeah, it became, and even like down to things like the guards have advised me that I can't have a constituency clinic, you know, your traditional one that you advertise in the paper. And then people come and meet you about their issues because I'm advertising where I am and that I'll be alone potentially. And it's like, it interferes with your job to the extent that you you can't do the same things as your constituency colleagues or your, you know, it kind of mm. impacts you every step of the mm. way. And then you also can't really say why it is that you don't do clinics. Um, so there's all of those different parts to it. But uh, for me, it for a while, it, it genuinely got to me so much. I took a big step back from doing any media, from doing anything like that, because I kind of had that feeling that I was drawing it on myself or, or something like that. But after a bit of time, this kind of realisation that like, it's really my job to highlight well, issues. as a career and, politician, you yeah. know, if you step back from doing media and if you stop doing clinics, yeah. you may not get elected the next time because people don't see you when you're not present. So it's a huge part of your work and your job is to be out there. 100%. And that's mm-hmm. what I really realised. That And and also there is that feeling of you, you don't want them to kind of win. And, yeah. to, and mm-hmm. even admitting that, I'm like, damn it, I don't want to admit that it did get to me. Um, and there's also, particularly, I think maybe when you're a female politician, the perception of being weak is something yeah. you don't want yeah. to put out there ever or, the you know, a victim. That's not the look I'm going for in politics. So that's why I think none of us want to talk about it. Um, but I think as women as well, it's very difficult. You don't really want to acknowledge that you're at some level of disadvantage to your male counterpart or colleague. And it's something that, you know, I would say I've come across that at times as well, where I've gone like, I don't want this to be an issue because of my gender. I don't want to have to deal with this because I'm a woman. And it's a really unfortunate. And so like that, you kind of ignore it and you push on and you think that actually if I just ignore it, it'll go away. And then, as you say, the reality of it comes to your door and then you're faced with it dealing with a bigger issue. Yeah. And yeah. you're actually just terrified. <laughs> yeah. Can I just ask, how long did that, you know, you, you said that that started off with messages online and then this guy eventually started turning up to your house. Like how long was that transition or how long did that campaign really mm. go on for Holly? I think altogether it was maybe over six months or more. Yeah. It's difficult to remember, even though it's not that long ago, but it started off with messages and then turning up to the house. And, you know, I started off by kind of trying to deal with it myself, like, please leave the property and don't come back, being very stern. And then there'd be like loads more messages into the work phone, like, I'm so sorry. You know, really overstepped a line and thinking, OK, great. And was this person coming again? to talk to you about it? I presume they weren't coming to talk about a constituency issue. This was not the, the motive for, for calling around. No, it was uh, much more kind of um, threatening than that, but mm. in a kind of, how do I explain it? Was it veiled as a romantic pursuit? Yeah. OK. Yeah. That this was so romantic, I'm turning up at your door mm. and I'm making this gesture and I'm declaring my feelings for you. Yeah. OK. Um, and then like I contacted the guards and they were really like kind of encouraging me to make a, an official statement and then it would go to court and all of those things. But then, of course, you know that that's a public trial. Yeah. It's going to be followed mm-hmm. by the media and mm-hmm. like anything like that. It's like it's you that's on trial, mm-hmm. <laughs> like mm-hmm. basically. And I just really didn't want to do that. And so yeah, the guards were really helpful in that sense. And they did kind of speak to the person and they backed off again, but then they were back and it'd be like when I was up in Dublin, there'd be messages coming in saying, I'm outside your house. And 
much. It's all of this kind of stuff, it went on for a long time, but I can't actually remember exactly how long. One of the things when you talk to other women and politicians and other high profile women that they talk about is unsolicited pictures. Uh, and I mean, at the start of what you were reading out there, Zara, mm. stuff like, you know, dick pics and stuff like that is something which just happens really, really regularly. I mean, is that something which is part of your everyday experience or even that of your colleagues as well? I'm sure you, you, you've all had like experiences like this where you're getting just bombarded with this invasion of stuff that you have no control over. Yeah, and weirder than that actually is I got um, images, somebody was cutting out uh, uh, any porn that had the name Holly on it. And, Jeez, and sending it. Um, but yeah, you get a, a bit of everything. But I think the worst is just when it comes to your door or like yeah. I heard from other CDs that come into your constituency office and like I wouldn't go into my constituency office on my own. <laughs> really, <laughs> Holly? No, I wouldn't. No, you wouldn't go to the constituency office by yourself. <laughs> Not with the door unlocked. Yeah. No. Wow. Um, this is possibly a tricky question for mm. you to answer because it's it's maybe a perspective you don't have because mm. I know you're the only female TD for all of Cork City and County mm. uh, and you're in a political party, the Sock Dems, where four of the six TDs are women. So maybe it's a perspective you don't have. How much worse do you think it is for female TDs above and beyond what it might be for your male colleagues? I mean, how much more intense do you think that the sort of attention that you get and some of the correspondence, if that isn't too formal a mm. word, that you get that is beyond, for example, what Keanu Callaghan or Gary Gannon might get male colleagues in your party? I think that all TDs get abuse. I think it's a, an across the board problem. I think it's just that the nature of it is very different mm. that, that women get. I think it's always, it's kind of gendered, maybe it's very sexualized. Mm. Um, but I'm, I don't actually know if women get more or not. So there'd have to be some kind of a survey carried out, but I think mm. it's quite clear that it happens to both men and women. It's a big problem amongst both. And I saw male TDs speaking out in prime time about it. And there was that a TD had the, his car set on fire, yeah. you know. Yeah. I guess I, I'm, I'm not, actually sure is the truth. I think the thing about it as well though Holly is like there is a, a clear difference between you know there's an understandable frustration and we talk about that on the podcast every week um, amongst the public cost of living crisis and hospital waiting times and so people have this frustration and they and they want to take that frustration out on public representatives which uh, rightly yeah. or wrongly but I think what you're talking about is so different to that because it's like what you mentioned there when we talked about this person um, veiling that sort of approach to you as a romantic gesture and that actually a lot of the stuff that comes to your door is not about policy or politics yeah, really. It's actually it. not really yeah. anything to do with cost of living crisis or being on a hospital waiting list. I mean, if you were dealing with those things, you would almost probably think, right, you know, let me tackle it or that's something yeah. you can manage as a politician. Whereas this idea of this unwanted romantic advances from people is, ho is wholeheartedly unacceptable. And that is the difference between, I think, what we're seeing Yes. female TDs and male TDs experience. I mean, I don't know, maybe 100%. male TDs are having romantic approaches as well, but I mean, certainly it seems wow. that this is the key mm. difference. Yeah, and I think it's actually great that there's a discussion now starting yeah. about this because I think there is different types of abuse that are that is levelled at us. And when we look at a lot of the abuse that we're getting, the, the politics in general is getting. Yeah. And it, it seems to me like, I don't know when before people would throw a bag of shit at a minister, essentially. Mm. Like something is changing in our society and we do have to look at why that is. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me like there's a lot of people now who just feel like they have nothing to lose. And how at the end of your tether do you have to be to kind of feel like that? Mm. And I don't know, is it that the, the discourse and line is seeping into how we behave in day to day life? Or is it because poorer people are getting poorer? And I'm not saying that's ever an excuse for God, I don't mean that to go after a politician in that way at all. Mm. But we have to kind of look at what, like, what is the change in our society and why is this happening? That people are behaving in a way that I don't think that they did before. And then separately, there is this looking at this kind of, you know, perceived as perhaps romantic advances mm. or whatever yeah. it might be levelled at women. And I wonder is the, like, I would think, and that's why one of the reasons I never want to speak of it before was deterring women from going into politics because of I course. think one of the things that will help it yeah. is if we have more diversity in politics. Yeah. You know, the fact that there's kind of less women there, you maybe get more of it because you're kind of, mm. you know. That's kind of what I wanted to ask because yeah. I think one thing about you that which is striking about it is that obviously you're a first time TD. Uh, you've had a lot of high profile sort of successes in the doll issues that you've raised, whether that be animal rights, things of that nature. Do you feel that that's, there's an element of just trying to put you in your place as a woman, that they feel that you're a young female politician, they want to silence you, they want to stop you, that there is an element of that nature to what you are getting and, and the, the sort of the nature of the abuse that you're receiving? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, even like particularly on issues are around reproductive rights yeah. or 
greyhound racing. Mm. They are two issues that draw a kind of other level of abuse, to be honest. Like I remember before uh, me and a, a counsellor, um, Elise O'Donovan, organising an event yeah. in Limerick and like in advance of that, I, it was around that time where I was actually kind of a bit overwhelmed with the level of abuse and getting, uh, I think we were getting emails that time saying that to watch my back at that meeting and people were going to turn up because of my stance on the funding for the greyhound racing industry and feeling like, would I cancel the meeting? Would I contact the guards? And it's like, then you're going into those kind of events, actually really scared. I got my cousins who live in Limerick and I asked them to come to the event and walk there with me and walk back with me mm-hmm. to where I was staying because I was petrified. Um, and I think there certainly is an element of that, that it's when you speak on those issues that it's, who do you think you are? Which then yeah. gets into it's kind, of, kind of tricky territory because, of course, there still has to be some space where people who, you know, think that greyhound racing is a traditional passion and it ought to be something which is safeguarded by the state, albeit with the, the controversial aspects of it, which we know your views are on. Yeah. But they, they would say, well, you know, there is a place in society for this and therefore there is a place in civil society for us to question you about your attempt to, to drive it out. And, yes. and there has to be some space where Absolutely. people feel like that they can challenge public representatives for the positions they take. But of course, 100%. there has to be some limit somewhere along the way as well. Yeah. And if somebody had sent an email just saying we're go- we're coming to the meeting and this is our interest and it's we want to keep funding in the greyhound racing industry, that wouldn't have put the fear to me mm. at all. It was more the nature yeah. of the wording of it. Yeah. Because, um, yeah. Like I the totally watch your back is quite, the I mean, watch your back yeah. is, is quite. Obviously impressive. intimidating. It's designed yeah. to be intimidating. What, exactly. do, what do Gardaí say to you, um, Holly, when you ask for that advice or what's what's the recommendation to, to you when you ask for that help? Um, anytime I've contacted the Gardaí, I have to say I've found them exceptionally helpful and mm-hmm. kind of supportive. And I don't know if that's everyone's experience in terms of the other politicians. Because what I'm asking is, I know there was a conversation about, you know, women being told to wear flat shoes, yes, for example. Yes, I was going to ask. Mm. Yeah. yeah, to make a quick getaway. They never said think... that to me, thankfully. Okay, good, <laughs> good. I'm glad, I'm but, does that, that. but does that advice, because that advice was given then to, to people who are in the Oireachtas, mm-hmm. does that speak to some level of that should be grand. It's only a bit of chat online and stuff like that. That there's almost a, a, an underplaying of the seriousness of it. That the advice is wear comfy shoes and just ignore it and it'll all go away. Yeah, I think that there there was an element of that. But that statement, it just didn't make any sense to anybody. I don't think wearing comfortable shoes isn't going to help at the end of the day. We all know that. It's a, it's a kind of a, maybe it speaks to the fact that we don't really know what the solution is. Yeah. And I think there's a couple of like, basic things that could be done in terms of like, I was warned before I went into politics about abuse, but I genuinely thought that people meant like the kind of abuse about your political stance on something Mm. that is part of democracy. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that people meant somebody turning up at your house or sending you that kind of stuff in the post. So even just down to like a basic thing for, for newly elected members to say, you might expect some of this might be a good idea to get locks. It might be a good idea to get CCTV, might be a good idea to have blinds, even things like that. I think I would have loved a heads up mm-hmm. yeah. um, and that's very basic and it doesn't solve the problem, but it's one thing that could be done and there's more. But unless we talk about what those things are, nothing's going to happen until, like I said, I think we're kind of just maybe waiting for something terrible to happen. Yeah. Well, I think like a lot of us, I suppose the tragic death of or the murder of Joe Cox in the UK at the time yeah. that, you know, that wasn't that far away. You know, mm-hmm. it was very close to home. But I think even around that time, I think people were sort of like, oh, well, aren't we grateful that Irish politics isn't quite that hostile? But that was a couple of years ago now and things have really changed since then. And since then, there was David Ames, who yeah. was uh, yeah. murdered doing a constituency clinic. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was I heard MPs in the UK now doing their clinics with stab vests on or whatever. So, mm. yeah, I mean, it's gotten to a stage where we need to do something about it. And I think even if if there wasn't this fear of talking about it that we all have, if there was kind of a bit more, even that we were putting out the fact that like, yeah, when we get these letters in the post, we give them to the guards. Mm-hmm. When we get these abusive messages online, we report them. Even if we were kind of saying like, <laughs> these are the things we're doing, would that not be a slight deterrent? I think that we need to kind of stop the not talking about it, even though I completely understand why we all feel like that. And yeah. like credit due to people like um, Jennifer Cameron McNeil, who took a case, yeah. Yeah. made yeah. a kind of public example of like, this isn't acceptable. And unfortunately, we should be spending our time working on other issues, but perhaps this needs to be given some mm. bit of time because who would want to go into politics? Uh, and has it made you consider whether or not you want to do this further on or has it given you a resolve that I'm not going to let this beat me or what, what's, what's the feeling? Because I mean, it has to have obviously given you some doubts and some sort of feeling about is this really a career for me? 
I, I have to say it did briefly. I remember yeah. thinking I don't when I genuinely didn't feel safe anywhere. And then in my own home for a while, I did feel like that. But I certainly don't now. And right. just after a bit of time to maybe recover from it or understand mm. it a bit more, reflect, I don't know what. Mm. Um, I do have that feeling that, you know, we need to do something about this, but absolutely will not let us mm. kind of knock me back because, any more than it already has. Because uh, I suppose right. people would wonder that if you knew then what you know now, a lot of people would wonder that why would you get into it? So uh, what would be your advice to young women who might aspire to get into politics to follow in the likes of your footsteps, but who might be turned off by the sort of experiences that you're telling us about today? I think it's better to be completely honest with people. And I have to say, if I knew what I was getting myself into, no, I would not have done it. Am I glad I didn't know? A hundred percent because I don't regret it, you know, but honestly, if I had known realistically, no, I, I probably wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't change it for the world, though. I'm very glad to be in my position. I feel very honoured to be and I absolutely want to continue. I'll be running again. Um, but I just think we need to see this change to, in order to get more people into politics. Like you said, I'm the only woman in Cork who's a TD representing the entire county. And I think there has to be, you know, just say even looking at the female aspect of it, when we do Q&As on the Instagram, getting messages in about being single, th are you single, mm. things like mm. this. Like we just need to start calling it out and getting rid of it more and more and more in order to encourage more women to come in. I think my approach of trying to kind of be silent about it, pretend it isn't there, that's not working. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, we need to just kind of change that approach. And hopefully with a bit of awareness, it will have a positive impact on the whole situation that we're kind of talking about at the moment. Yeah. But well, I don't know. We really appreciate you being so honest yeah. with us today, Holly, and coming in and speaking about it. Because I know it's a really big deal for you to speak up about this today. But I actually think, you know, adding a voice to that and, and putting a face to that voice is a hugely important part of this debate. So thank you so much for joining us.